What better way to start off an American election year than talking about a movie where the Antichrist takes a crack at infiltrating politics so as to turn all of humanity against one another and lead to the ultimate destruction of the human race as we know it? Some may call this a bad omen. That was a very stupid intro, I apologize. Good evening. My name's Evan, and welcome to Rockland Graves. There's a new Omen movie coming out later this year, so I figured now would be a perfect time to dive into the franchise thus far and see where we're at before the new one is upon us. I think I saw this for the first time when I was, like, 12, maybe? And I don't think I've seen it since then. I, I definitely liked it back when I first saw it, but I was too young to properly appreciate it. And now, revisiting it as an adult? Oh my god. The film stars Gregory Peck as Robert Thorne, an American diplomat whose baby tragically died immediately after being born, leading him to adopt a newborn whose mother didn't survive the birth so he could hide the death of his child from his wife. Unfortunately, it seems Robert may have brought something into his home that yearns for his political power, and he soon finds himself and his wife in danger of something truly evil. I feel like when we talk about cursed movie productions, The Exorcist is the first one most people bring up, and that's for good reason. A lot of shit went horribly wrong on set and around the filming of that movie, but the amount of straight-up tragedy attached to the filming of The Omen is just ridiculous. There is genuinely enough to make a whole dedicated video about, but to list just a few of the insane occurrences, Gregory Peck and screenwriter David Seltzer both took planes over to the UK that were struck by lightning during the flight, producer Harvey Bernard was nearly struck by lightning while in Rome, Director Richard Donner was in a hotel that was bombed by the IRA, and he was hit by a car. There were a number of deaths attached to the production as well, one of which even had similarities to a death from the movie itself. It's absolutely insane just how much went wrong surrounding this thing. A lot of it's just really sad, but if you're interested, you can go read about it because I don't want to focus too much time on everything that went wrong, largely because I don't really know how to respectfully approach some of it since we're dealing with actual deaths of actual people, so including that in a review for a movie on a goofy channel, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. I'm gonna try and awkwardly pivot away from that now and get into the actual movie. The Omen makes one hell of a first impression with its opening credits thanks to this striking image that sits perfectly still along the names while the absolutely stellar score from Jerry Goldsmith plays. For a movie dealing with the birth of the Antichrist and the impending doom of all humanity, it's important that the music reflects the dark religious history and satanic feel of the storyline. And it does. Flick this movie on, you know you picked the right thing for movie night pretty quickly. As far as stories go, I think the idea of the Antichrist being adopted into a powerful family in the government to try and subtly dismantle humanity through politics is one of my favorite stories in horror. There's something so beautifully ominous and chilling about that idea, and the movie consistently delivers on all the potential that concept has. What makes it all work is the way the narrative is delivered, where there's a lot going on behind the scenes that were not directly shown, whether it be at first or simply left up to the imagination even after the credits roll, and that does a lot to give the satanic conspiracy a more sinister feel because it feels like we're being tricked along with the characters. There's all sorts of little seeds planted from the very first scene of the movie that our characters later find out was a part of a plot to bring the Antichrist to power. It's chilling. Robert Thorne is a politician whose baby died immediately after it was born, but his wife Kathy somehow didn't know that happened. He's approached by a priest who coaxes Robert into adopting a baby who was born tonight as well, whose mother didn't survive the birth, selling it as an all-around win for those involved. Your wife need never know. The baby will have parents, and Kathy won't know of the terrible tragedy that met her child. Robert's hesitant at first, but the seed is ultimately planted when he agrees and brings the child into his family. On this night, Mr. Thorne, God has given you a son. Something like that. 
Over the years, Robert climbs higher through the government, eventually being appointed ambassador to Great Britain, and he's living the high life now. He and Kathy move into an opulent manor in the countryside, and things are looking bright for this family. It all starts to take a turn on Damien's fifth birthday party, when his nanny hangs herself in front of the entire gathering from a window in the manor after she has a stare down with this Rottweiler that's lurking around the grounds. It's a really shocking moment that's become one of the more iconic scenes in horror, but what's great about how the Omen handles these kinds of events is that they don't happen very often. This isn't Lucius, where people are dying left and right in brutal ways. This movie really takes its time to build up a sense of tension, allowing these bigger moments to have more of an impact. By the way, I'm kind of considering streaming Lucius before the first Omen comes out. I think that could be fun. Starting off the downward spiral of events with this crazy moment and then dialing things back to slowly let it all unravel is such an effective way of pacing the story and letting that looming knowledge that something evil is taking place seep in through the quieter moments. Also, the score for when the Rottweiler shows up is just awesome. <laughs> The movie does a fantastic job at setting up this conspiracy surrounding Damien in so many ways, but there is one very short scene that I think should have been cut because it breaks up that looming buildup. After the nanny dies, another shows up that neither Robert or Kathy called for, but she manages to explain it away to them. The agency. They read in the paper about the about your first nanny, so they get... They sent you another. This is all great, but I think that this moment where Mrs. Baylock goes into Damien's room and talks to him in such an outwardly evil way takes away from a lot of the later moments with this character and spells things out a little too clearly in a story that otherwise leaves nearly everything vague until much later on, if they even explain it at all. The scene that made me really wish that this was left out is when Damien's parents are bringing him along to a wedding at a church and Mrs. Baylock starts talking to Kathy about thinking that Damien is too young to be exposed to ideas as heavy as the church presents. Do you really think a five-year-old will understand the goings-on of an Episcopal wedding? Despite Kathy's continued insistence that Damien's coming with them, Mrs. Baylock continues to push back against the idea of him going with them. And I can't help but think about how much more bone-chilling this scene would have been if we hadn't already been plainly shown that this woman is evil. Scatter moments like this around the movie without that interaction between her and Damien, and I think that whole plot line would have had so much more impact. Robert eventually finds the Rottweiler from the party inside the house, acting very defensively outside of Damien's room, and Mrs. Baylock, trying to convince Robert to let the dog stay as he stands firm that he wants it taken away, is another scene that would have been a lot creepier. Apparently, the character was originally written much sweeter and less creepy, but Billy Whitelaw took it into her own hands to play the character with a more sinister feel, and I guess the director liked it, so who am I? Well, I think she played it well. I don't think that this was the right decision for the character. It would have made more sense for her to be this sweet and unassuming lady who slowly shows signs of ulterior motives instead of us knowing very early on that she's evil and seeing how creepy she acts in every scene. To me, this takes away from that character and I think the original intention for her would have made for an even stronger narrative. The issues that I have with Mrs. Baylock are an example of the thing that I think is the weakest part of the movie, which I will get to more in a little bit. But considering that White Law still does play the character she chose to play well, it's a damn good sign. I just wish this could have been left the way it was originally intended to be. Thankfully, the majority of the characters are handled incredibly well and all serve the story effectively. Gregory Peck gives a fantastic performance as Robert Thorne as he slowly unravels this conspiracy involving Damien. Peck gives a lot of strong authority to the character, which makes the moments when he feels truly overwhelmed by the reality of the situation all the more impactful because it feels like a genuinely strong person being broken down by something truly sinister. We don't see Robert in many political contexts in the movie, but Peck's performance makes it so that you can feel that this is someone who's used to being in control of a situation, and if he's not, he's very good at redirecting things in the way he wants them, making this progressively worsening situation that he really can't control all the more horrifying to witness. I also really enjoyed Lee Remick's performance as Kathy, because even though her character really isn't the focus of the story and she doesn't get a ton of screen time, when she is in a scene, she really takes control of it, and a lot of the emotion of the story gets conveyed through her. Remick also had to do quite a frightening scene alongside the young Harvey Stevens, where the two of them go to a zoo and drive through the baboons, which get scared by Damien and attack the car. The thing is, Remick's reaction here was completely genuine, because the way this was done was by putting the head of the baboons in the back seat of the vehicle and letting the rest of them violently attack the car to try and save their leader. So Remick and Stevens 
we're actually subjected to being inside of a car under attack by furious baboons thinking that their top dog was in peril. I can only imagine how scary that must have been, but I also can't deny that it makes for a damn convincing scene because, well, the, the fear's all real. Kathy gets dealt a pretty rough hand in the story where she bears the brunt of a lot of the things that happen around Damien. It's revealed that she's pregnant but doesn't want to keep the child much to Robert's chagrin, who feels a need for her to see the pregnancy through because a creepy priest, who I'll get to in a second, foretold that she was pregnant and that the baby would be killed because it would stand in the way of Damien's rise to power. Not much Robert can do about it though because Kathy gets knocked over a railing in their house by Damien as he rides around on his little tricycle and she lands directly on her stomach, killing the baby in the process. It's really disturbing and my god almighty does this dude not know how to speak with someone who just had something like this happen to someone he loves. You've got a lot to be grateful for. She's still alive. It's made even worse later on when Kathy's attacked by Mrs. Baylock and thrown through a window in the hospital where we get the one moment in the movie that I can't quite figure out if it was meant to be tongue-in-cheek because she lands directly on a gurney in an ambulance. She's a really tragic character and the very believable relationship between her and Robert carried by two fantastic performances adds a lot to the weight of this plotline. It's just really sad, and it works so well because of how long the movie takes to build up their family dynamic as something really sweet, but also complex through this disagreement they have about the pregnancy. The way they handle themselves in this dynamic feels very grounded and genuine, and you can tell that Kathy is the only person who can bring Robert to his knees. They love each other deeply, and the movie communicates this through their interactions and not just by having them say, I love you all the time. It's a perfect example of the magic that can happen when all the different elements of making a movie come together beautifully because everything from the way their shared scenes are shot and scored to their performances to how they're written is imperative to bringing this all together. This is how it's done, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about the priest I mentioned a moment ago because he's also quite important in bringing everything together. I have issues with his character as well because of the way they chose to have him deliver almost every single line in this very over-the-top doomsday is approaching sort of way. And this is what I meant when I was talking about how Miss Baylock is a good example of the main issue I have with the Omen. I think that this is the thing where it runs into the most issues. To me, one of the things about this story that has the most potential is that it allows for a very grounded approach to a deeply religious story that can be set in a world that we're familiar with. And I think the characters surrounding that narrative should be portrayed in a way that's also more familiar than the constant Bible scripture lingo so it feels more believable. One of the scariest things to me about the concept of the Antichrist rising to power through politics is that it feels like the most likely way this sort of thing would happen, so making sure that the characters feel grounded in our society would also let the story lean more into that believability. It's not like this stuff ruins the movie or anything, but I think keeping this sort of thing to a minimum and keeping everyone very grounded would have made this even more impactful than it already is. Father Brennan here shows up to warn Robert about what Damien truly is, but Robert's not even willing to hear him out at first because he doesn't want any chance of admitting that he's been lying to his wife for all these years. That would be equal parts damaging to his career and his marriage, so it takes him convincing before Robert's willing to even listen to what the man has to say. Eventually though, he agrees to meet him in a park where Brennan reveals that he was in the hospital on the night that Robert's son was born and insinuates that Damien is not human. He begs Robert to take communion so that he and Kathy will be protected from the evil in their home, and they can hopefully put a stop to this before the plan is played out. Robert's naturally very dismissive of what Father Brennan is telling him, and after he leaves and tells the man to never come near him again, a dark storm brews. Brennan reads this as something more than nature, and tries to run straight to the church for safety, but He's impaled by a lightning rod before he can get inside. It's a really cool scene that feels very biblical in all the best ways, and it also ties directly in with Keith Jennings, another very important character that I haven't mentioned yet. He's a photographer who's been showing up every once in a while, and he comes into play for the story after the death of Father Brennan. Keith reveals to Robert that he's been finding artifacts in his photos that seem to be omens for how people will die. I took on the day that you were at the rugby match. Same thing. Only it's more pronounced this time, and it's actually making contact with the body. The photos of the nanny who hung herself and Father Brennan both showed these same artifacts that seemed to reflect the ways they both met their fates, and he's now seen one on photos of himself, so 
He brought this all to Robert so he can try and figure out how to put a stop to these horrible events. Keith's character serves to add a lot more legitimacy to the claims Father Brennan was making, and he's also the one who joins with Robert on a journey to try and piece together exactly what happened on the night Damien was born and what can be done to stop the coming evil. It's through their travels that we learn a number of disturbing things, like how the hospital that Damien was born in was burned down from a fire that started in the records room in the basement, making it impossible for Robert and Keith to track down who Damien's mother truly was and destroying Kathy's birth records as well. Most of the staff was killed, however, the priest that suggested the adoption to Robert managed to escape the fire and was then sent to a monastery where he sits now in near Catatonia. This is where things start to get even darker. Father Spoleto confessed to the others at the monastery that he turned his back from God, and it seems that he was involved with the conspiracy. Perhaps out of guilt built up in the years since Damien's birth, he tells Robert where Damien's biological mother is buried, so... He and Keith make their way to the decrepit burial site that's still one of the most memorable locations I've seen in a movie. I think it had been like 10 years since I'd last seen this movie, and the main thing that I remembered was the imagery from this scene. It's a pivotal moment in the story because it's here where Robert finds a jackal buried in Damien's mother's coffin, seemingly confirming the disturbing truth that Father Brennan was trying to tell Robert in the park. Say, what is it that you're trying to say? His mother was a jackal! It doesn't end there though, because in the other plot they find a small skeleton with a hole smashed into its skull, which Robert realizes is the body of his son. He didn't die of natural causes, he was murdered mere minutes after being born to make way for Damien to enter the Thorn family. It's clear now that what Father Brennan was trying to tell Robert was true, and that Damien is a true threat. Robert and Keith are then chased from the site by a pack of Rottweilers, so it seems that the Hounds of Hell are on their trail. This whole sequence is just absolutely fantastic, and one of the things I love the most about it is that sense that they're being watched the entire time. From the moment they get here, we're seeing perspective shots that imply the presence of something else, which does seem to be the hounds ultimately, but it could also be that there was more watching them here under cover of darkness. It's also just a visual stunner, with this otherworldly dark feel as the two stand in this deeply unholy place. I love this moment juxtaposed with the very clinical feel of the hospitals and the opulent home because it gives a sense of legitimacy to the fact that the threat here is coming from another world. Robert and Keith learn of a man in Israel who's an expert on the Antichrist, and he tells Robert that he needs to check for a birthmark of three sixes on Damien's body. If he finds this mark, he has to take Damien to hallowed ground and ritualistically kill him with seven daggers, which Robert is morally opposed to despite what he knows. This is a lot to take in, but thankfully, Keith's got a good head on his shoulders, and he says if Robert won't do it, then he will. Scratch that last. Nowadays, this isn't anything particularly shocking, although I guess it could be in certain contexts just because of how few and far between these kinds of moments are in this movie, but I can only imagine what audiences in 1976 must have felt seeing Keith get his head sliced clean off fully on screen. This is a thing that makes Robert see what's truly at stake if he doesn't go through with the ritual, so he returns home and finds the birthmark on Damien's scalp, confirming what we already pretty much knew. Oh, by the way, we're into ending territory now, so if you want to preserve at least the ending for yourself, then skip to the conclusions chapter, and this is one where I will insist, if you haven't seen the movie, please, this climax is insane. Skip to the next one if you haven't seen it. Mrs. Baylock attacks Robert, but he manages to take her out and escape with Damien, making it to the church, but not before getting into a police chase because of how erratic he's being. He carries the Antichrist up to the altar and prepares for the ritual, but he's gunned down by police just before he's able to go through with it. Which, like, fair enough. This doesn't look great. The whole sequence of Robert taking Damien from the house to the church actually really disturbed me more than most movies have in a long while. It's such an upsetting scene because despite being the embodiment of evil and a conduit for Satan's work, Damien is still a child and it's played by a child. Steve Harvey is given Steve Harvey. Harvey Stevens is giving a very good performance. And it makes it very hard to watch. It's really upsetting to see this child squirming around and crying and panicking knowing what's coming. Even if it's not for reasons we should feel bad about- I'm sorry, I can't- <laughs> I can't stop thinking now about if Steve Harvey played Damien. Alright, well, if they make a sequel to The First Omen, which I guess would just be the, uh, this movie, 
Can they just cast Steve Harvey and not acknowledge it? Anyway, I actually did have a bit of a hard time watching this section of the movie, but I think that's one of the things that makes The Omen so special. The way it deals with this story isn't over the top or overly dramatic. It's a very grounded and immersive portrayal filled to the brim with some extremely heavy and emotional moments that make the stakes feel very real. The final scene of the movie shows a funeral held for Robert and Kathy. The US president and the first lady are in attendance and all of Robert's efforts to save the world from this evil seem to have been for nothing. Every part of the plan was accomplished and it looks like Damien may be brought in by the president himself, left to climb the ladder of control and bring about the end of humanity. What a chilling ending, eh? It's really damn bleak, and it leaves quite a mark with the realization that everything that was lost still led to the plan being seen all the way through. So that's The Omen. It's easily one of the greats in the horror genre, and I think it's one that doesn't quite get enough love. It's an incredibly emotional, dark, and disturbing story, expertly executed all around from cinematography, score, direction, writing, performances, it's all just stellar. The few less great spots like Mrs. Baylock's characterization and the cheesy monologue heavy scenes with Father Brennan are unfortunate, but they don't put too much of a damper on what's overall one of the most airtight, well-crafted religious horror movies you can find. The sense of unraveling mystery is so engaging, and the more that gets revealed, the more the movie hooks into you because of just how compelling the story is. The Omen is fantastic, and I really appreciate you joining me as we kick off the series leading up to the release of the first Omen in April. I'm spreading these videos out a little more than I did with the Exorcist franchise to give myself time to breathe between sequels and also so I can keep some more variation on the channel, so next up, we're starting another franchise that I'm really excited about with All Hallows' Eve. The first feature-length film with horror's biggest up-and-coming icon, Art the Clown. I'm very excited to dive into this franchise and the Terrifier franchise, and we're also doing Quiet Place soon. There's a bunch of stuff coming up. It's a, we got a busy couple months here. So until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.